when we're teaching, we ask the students more questions than we answer. Their ideas and solutions are really much more interesting than any uh, doctrine or codified approach that we might present to them, and it's often more relevant. We teach the course collaboratively, and that's at the core, because it's a, a discipline of collaboration. This has its moments of peril. There have been moments when we've walked in with the same lesson plan, and he went one way and I went the other. And I used to be absolutely terrified by those moments, but I've learned to trust them because usually with some discussion, and often including the students in that discussion, the idea that comes out of our disagreement is more interesting than my original idea in the first place. And I hope that our collaborative relationship is a positive model for our students and that they will, um, as they get started in their professional career as well, see it as a model. Once we get them started, they also learn from each other across disciplines. Students gain knowledge from grappling with their differences in approach and point of view, and every class project, of course, involves collaboration. The students not only invest in the work, they invest in each other. So our first step is to blow apart the students' proscenium stage, the dance students' proscenium stage orientation. We give them permission to make the camera, or the audience's eye, the camera, and we give them the power to move the audience's point of view and perception. This opens up a world of interesting possibilities. For example, the impact of a bird's eye camera angle on a turn would portray a, a interesting design, whereas a close-up on the feet of that turning dancer would really give more information about the mechanics of the turn or the effort involved. Another simple example is moving a camera or dollying, dollying it in on a group of dancers brings the uh, point of view of the audience into the group, invites them in, whereas that same shot, long shot to close up with a zoom, simply magnifies an element of the group. When dollying, the depth of field travels with the camera. Thus, the viewer has a greater sense of dimension. It's more immediate. It's like they come in. Whereas the zoom tends to flatten the image. Both are valid uses. The question we would ask is when would one use one, when would one use the other? And then we would ask the question, what are other possibilities from going from the long shot to a close up that you might explore? We continue to ask those questions like, what would happen if? Is there another way of doing that? And what impact does that have on your intention? The moving spatial relationships between the camera and dancer also open the doors to some interesting possibilities, or many interesting possibilities. For example, if you were to move a camera sideways or truck it alongside of a running dancer, it would look like the dancer was going nowhere fast unless you had foreground and background elements that created a reference point for that motion of the dancer. It could be a wonderful shot, a beautiful shot, but it wouldn't give the idea of moving through space. If the intention was to move through space or to give the audience that idea, one interesting solution might be to focus on the, the dancer on a head-to-toe shot, but move in opposite directions. This would actually amplify the sense of motion. So what are some of the other interesting possibilities? During the, the progression of each semester, the students rotate in their roles, wearing the hat of each person involved in a video production really gives one perspective, gives them a total view, helps in their communication. In one project, we might ask the sculpture major to direct, the filmmaker to choreograph, the dancer to operate the camera or edit, and the video director to be talent. And the result is usually very interesting. And then the next project, we switch roles. Often the filmmakers come up with some choreographic ideas that really help us talk about how the camera sees in relation to movement. And they're very exciting. Uh, through the years in teaching this course, I've been fascinated with how our students' reasons for taking the course have changed. It used to be that we'd ask them on the first day of class in 1988, um, 
they would say, oh, I want to videotape my choreography for grants. Well, that's still a very valid reason. Or um, I want to get a graduate school application together. Others say they want to learn how to use the equipment. But I was very amused by one dancer's reason for taking the class, and that was that she wanted to edit all the mistakes out of her dancing. <laughs> we had a lot of work to do. <laughs> Students from other departments usually indicated that it was one of a tiny pool of courses that were offered that included video, and they heard it was a good class. But now, things have evolved at VCU. We have a new BFA in photography and film that I'm very excited about, as well as a the kinetic imagery track, which has animation and uh, video included in the curriculum. In cr contrast to 1988, our students now currently actually say they have an interest in working in the combined medium. So your curating has had an impact. Uh, and the sculpture majors certainly cite interest in incorporating video and movement into their installation work. This is exciting. One dance student said that she wanted to challenge the way that she sees. Another student uh, who came into our dance program from the club dance scene said that he really came to modern dance in the first place because he was totally blown away by something he saw on this program when he was a kid called a live TV. That student is now dancing with Ralph Lemon. Our equipment resources have also changed. I'll never forget lugging our home television set to the studio <coughs> to teach our class. Uh, our department's old television set was really awful. We had 18 students and one single tube camera, and we often joked about what it would be like to teach swimming without a pool. But anything is really possible if you're persistent, and through the years we've developed a really more than adequate equipment inventory for an autonomous dance program with a single course in video choreography, plus the uh, other departments in the School of the Arts have some of the wonderful things like digital editing and uh, animation programs. We do have eight camcorders now and a Betacam SP uh, three chip camera and a live switcher and a number of other things. The course content has changed through each year as well, as we've grown and as the field has evolved. However, our reasons for teaching video dance remain consistent and numerous. Our goal is to help lay the groundwork for our students so that they can continue the development of this art form of video dance, or whatever we want to call it. We give the dancers a foundation from which they can build and we hope to encourage and also educate interested filmmakers and video directors. Our course also in encourages interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, the development of verbal and nonverbal communication skills, mm -hmm. and it requires the dancers to think differently in a, an extensively studio-oriented BFA dance program. It's easy for dancers to become myopic in their vision, and we're very committed to continuing to develop coursework that gets their mind outside of their bodies so that there's more dimension to their education. It also opens up career opportunities for dancers. Um, one of our dancers recently <coughs> spent a year operating a camera for a local television station. Another is choreographing for MTV, and many of them are including video dance as part of the body of their creative work. With the vast developments in video, internet, computer technology, dance will not thrive unless we support artists who have an interest in understanding of how camera, a camera sees movement. We can have all the technology in the world, all the bells and whistles, but if these special challenges of working with dance and the camera are not addressed, on a grassroots level, the representation of dance in this world of technology could be limited to small groups like this. I have an example of this. Last fall, Virginia Tech University invited me to present a live, interactive dance performance on Internet 2. 
Uh, Internet 2 is this new technology that can see movement more completely. It, it resolves movement without the, the stop action look that we saw earlier. And um, we're very excited about it. They told me that there was a studio in Richmond, Virginia that had the capability to broadcast on Internet 2 across the country and it would be inter uh, broadcasting our live performance to a conference, the Internet 2 conference in Seattle. I asked for a site visit of this studio and uh, encouraged Bruce to come with me and he complied. And when we arrived at the studio, we discovered that what these respected experts in internet technology called a studio, or what I would call a studio, uh, we discovered that it was a very small carpeted audience, uh, office with lots of computer equipment and a tiny digital camera locked down on top of a monitor, which is a nightmare for someone like me. And Bruce, uh, in his way, very calmly said, and why do you want to broadcast a live dance performance from here? And the reply was, because it would be so visual and exciting. And I talked about, well, you know, we're, it, it's, <laughs> this is really going to limit us, this setup. And I talked about how the camera sees movement and a lot of the stuff we've talked about here. And finally, I said, we can't do a performance here. Don't even call it a performance. Just forget it. But what we will do is a presentation, an interactive presentation on how a camera sees movement. And so we did. And we brought a dancer and a musician and our live switcher down to this Internet 2 studio. And Bruce operated one camera, which was our professional camera. And we would switch live to the digital, the little digital camera, so that the audience in Seattle could see what he was doing and then we would switch to his camera so that the audience could see the effect or the shot, the actual shot that he was creating. At the beginning of the presentation, oh, and another thing that was important is a colleague of ours, uh, Rob Kitsos, conversed with us from the Seattle end. We were very um, serious about the interactive part, and so he was there and I could see him. Although they set up his monitor <coughs> like this, and our camera was looking at it Adam like this, so I was talking to someone who was like this to me, which <laughs> was very disconcerting. I couldn't tell where, who he was talking to. That was interaction. <laughs> it was a lot of technology between that interaction. Anyway, uh, we set up our camera, I gotta hurry, we set up our camera on top of the monitor right next to this digital camera because we knew that the viewers would have looked at many, many presentations with this lockdown camera, and we wanted them to think that our camera was one of those. So we began the session, and I talked a little bit about what we were going to do, and then the side, I said, but the first thing we have to do is take this camera off the monitor. And Bruce reached for the camera, and the big screen in Seattle reeled around, and we heard this <gasps> gasp of 300 people in the audience, and uh, we had their attention as we set up the first head-to-toe shot of the dancer. At the end of the session, Rob Kitsos, with his help, we were able to get those uh, technology folks to help us direct a video shoot with our dancer. That was a lot of fun. But the point is that the more people we can introduce to this idea that it takes more than technology to make dance happen on the internet or on television, the better off we are. Dance enrollments are up. I like to think that with this generation that grew up with technology, that they crave because computers tend to move us physically farther and farther away from the tangible, that they miss this. They miss being inside of their bodies, feeling the world they live in tactilely. We, we are not short of dance students, so the question is why? Why try to create live performance with technology? Well, I think we have to. Um, even though we can't package it, I think it becomes something else, and something else incredibly exciting. Also, we need, we have found ways of documenting dance. They're imperfect, but we need to expand on them because that's our legacy. It is as important to our future as it is to our past, and to documenting our past for future generations. 
We need to give dancers the opportunity to work with video as an important part of their education, video or film or computers, computer technology. We need to continue to encourage choreographers to develop collaborations with film and video professionals who have an interest in working with dance. This is important, as I said, to creating our legacy. In these times when television is our culture's most powerful medium, dance needs to continue to find exciting ways to reach beyond the stage. And I really look forward to seeing what this new generation is going to do with dance and technology. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief, just in a couple of uh, sort of sum, they aren't summary remarks, they're just uh, responsive remarks, really. And I know I, I, we want to leave time open, but um, I feel in an interest. First of all, I'm very aware of my uh, body sensation at the moment, the increase of my heartbeat, et cetera. I think, <laughs> mm, how would I put that on video? And, you know, so that's one. I'm going to speak very free association and uh, very uh, responsive, also, which actually completely and utterly relates to the way that um, I both make work and teach, which again are utterly uh, inseparable, and I, I'm sure that's the case for everyone. And actually, um, and just in kind of a rush of different uh, uh, connections, I think the, this, this whole idea of being responsive uh, both to one another and from one media to another, instead of, uh, these are again just personal philosophies, but they also uh, relate to uh, uh, teaching. And even this idea of personal, uh, I, I keep, uh, this is, this is a, a key that is coming up in my mind in terms of how to, how to take in all of this different information that we've been exposed to, and how we encourage our students or our audiences to take into consideration all this, these different kinds of information that we're all trying to deal with and grapple with and make things with and, and still be open and flexible to the, the, the kind of wonder of the world, I hope. And so, you know, it's really, it's good um, to just keep remembering our, our personal uh, visions in terms of how they get into these institutions and to keep that personal uh, connection alive. I, I really appreciated all of these uh, uh, highly personal uh, and not uh, personal, idiosyncratic, and also how many things are shared uh, in these visions. Uh, just in listening to the, to the three of you, I really appreciated that. It was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. So um, I feel actually very grateful that I'm, I'm just able to, re to, to, to be inspired by what you said, all, all three of you. And, um, and it was interesting, another thing that I, I realized, so I just want to kind of keep reminding uh, myself and, and other people to keep this, the idea of the personal, both in terms of, um, also in terms of how to, how to uh, give and take uh, feedback and criticism rather than be uh, shut down by all of a sudden some sort of institutional whatever we all feel about that. We have different relationships with it. Sometimes it helps us, but other times it uh, uh, shuts us down. So this whole thing of the camera, the eye, whatever we're calling it, is to uh, still try and keep a, a, an open vision. I think that that's really at the heart always of, of, of what we're trying to say. So sometimes it's really helpful to keep remembering who we are personally uh, and um, how that extends. And that takes me to another word, which is that, that whole concept of extension. I was trying to think, I, I mean, I would be fascinated if all of us could write a huge long list of what, what we think this definition of, of, of video, dance, etc., is. And that would be an extensive uh, thing. So I, I think of the word extension uh, rather than, again, uh, anyway, this, I'm just going to put extension out there as a, as a big word, like extended choreographies. And instead of getting too hung up about how this medium works, how this one doesn't, how does this one extend or go out into uh, a, another one? And I really, uh, I feel like, for example, and then I, then I think just structurally, when I was listening to Deirdre, I was in sort of a linear fashion, an analog linear mode. And that was again, uh, it was like, oh yeah, point. You know, I was following point to point to point. And uh, then when I was listening to Lisa, I sort of fell into this, uh, what did I call it, a, a time-space continuum conundrum. 
And actually, I was, and, and I, I personally have not yet, personally again, have not yet really grappled with internet uh, choreography. So I feel fairly resistant before coming here. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but however, it, just in being uh, here, I, I, had, I had to kind of, you know, keep eating away, not eating away actually, I was inspired by uh, some of the images that you put up there just because of a current a project I'm working on, which is really all about sort of, it's called dig. It means, you know, it's another, like water, now I'm er, dig. It's uh, digging up old ideas and seeing how they project into the future. So I say, oh, God, I've got to, you know, I've got, so I've been inspired just by the exposure, which again takes us to this whole word of exposure, to continue the exposure with this kind of, we have no idea how we're going to respond until we actually have to see the stuff rather than the ideas about the stuff. And then uh, just the last, uh, because I, is just this idea of interaction, which bleeds into this other thing. It's just to try and keep interactive, not only in this, uh, uh, just, that's it. That's all I, I mean, there's tons, but I think if we could open it to questions and responses or just even ideas and, um, from you all. Actually, I have a <laughs> um, since I have control of the microphone, I'm going to start. <laughs> All right, I've been pretty quiet during this, this whole symposium, but I just wanted to make a comment, actually, on something Martha said, and that is the students in your class don't just invest time in the class, they invest time in each other. And I just want to say, being a student and being in the program that I am in arts and technology, that I've experienced the same, and that I hope that um, all the students and teachers that are here um, to really stress that, because I think that's very, very important, especially when working in multidisciplinary areas. So. I just want to say, that I think this was a, an excellent overview. I agree with what you're saying, Wendy, about the, the three different points of view, four different points of view now, but Lisa, I have to do this, I'm sorry. Um, you, you talked about this, this, this idea of a processing shot, and, um, to me, to, and, and you framed it in a digital world. And I just need to point out, I guess, or at least, well, point out that that to me, that's a that's a, a recapitulation of of something that already exists. The processing shot. I mean, in Doris' work certainly, and in in work that we don't have to even talk about. It, it's 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 part of the language already. And then you wanted to talk about digital technology, and showed some of the experiments you guys have been doing. And I think again, and please don't take this as a criticism, but it, it's an example to me of using new technologies to essentially repeat previous experiments with, in my mind, no or, or not enough discernible difference in, in regard to the outcome. And again, it's not a criticism, but it's just, it's really a comment on how we culturally tend to use new technologies in the first wave or even the second wave to, to simply repeat or recapitulate what, what we have already done. And, and that's pretty high on my list of self-critiquing and self-analyzing as a community. And I, maybe you can respond to that. Um, well, I'm not surprised that you're commenting on that. Um, certainly, I don't know the entire history of computer graphics and video and, and that whole um, bleed overlapping. Um, Doris's work was very inspiring to me. Um, as well as other people's, obviously. Everybody's here. Um, but I do think that there is something new uh, in some of the tools that we have now, especially when we look to real-time processing in the moment of the dance. And that the combination of what Martha was talking about, the interaction between the dancer and the person who is behind the camera in that moment the language that's used between the dancer and, and well, let me just draw you a little scenario. 
Uh, Laura James, who's in the audience here, is uh, one of my students, and she, she was she's the woman who is in the, the images on the screen. And when we were in uh, some of the sessions, there would be Laura, John, and I'd be on the, sh the back, and I would be directing in a sense, but there was this ongoing dialogue about the process, and that didn't stop in the rehearsal, and it didn't stop when we used some of the tools. And l working with some of those tools, we started looking at granularity in a way that really we hadn't seen before in terms of separating out dynamics of it. I didn't show you all the images, but some of the stuff that's happening there really does require um, a lot more looking into what are these tools and what can we do. And I question whether or not it's all been done before. Yes, we have a history and I'm certainly the first to, to respect that and take it somewhere and I, I'm very active in, the, in um, you know, what are we doing with dance history and technology? Um, but I do think we, it's not enough. We haven't been looking enough, and it's, it's too um, soon to say oh, it's all been done already. No, yeah. I, that's my, it's not my intention to say it's all been done. Yeah. What my real point is is that, it is that, well, this is a whole other thing, but the, the, the resources that are there already in the universities, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, that are underused and jettisoned in favor of newer, sexier ways to do essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of ways to make toast, mm -hmm. but you can still use your toaster to make toast. Mm -hmm. and, and if what you're after is toast, then it, you know, it really doesn't matter. So for instance, you know, live interactive dance performance, mm -hmm. which was featured in 1984 in a project by Namjoon Paik called Good Morning, Mr. Orwell. And, and probably previously, but certainly in that project, hasn't changed much since 1984. I guess one of the, one of the issues that uh, has come up for me is, is how we see this stuff. Uh, I, okay, I'll be, I'll be brief with this, but how we see this stuff. I mean, I still have problems looking at live, live dance and seeing projection behind. So it doesn't work sometimes. So in my, my process of working, my way of working, I am trying to make the processed dance integrated with the live performance. And so I'm trying to minimize the the taking the, the dances done over here and then I go to another way other over there and do something else and that's the process shot and hope they come together in some way. I'm, I'm trying to integrate the body process and the digital process so that they truly are extensions so that the tools that we're using really are extensions of that felt experience. Um, this is in response to Deidre's mention of this spa dance phenomenon. Um, and it, it's just a comment that I have, and I'm hoping maybe it opens up some kind of discussion to happen this week. Um, and that is the challenge with video dance, which I think is a healthy challenge, for particularly for young choreographers and things, to come up with movement um, that doesn't seem artificial when you put it, you know, when you take it out of our black box theater or something. It seems like when you put movement out in the real world, um, all of a sudden the dance vocabulary that, you know, that's so ingrained in our bodies and we just kind of take for granted, I think, and do cool moves because we know how to just doesn't really work anymore. And so then you have these spin-offs where <laughs> we turn into amoebas because that seems to be less obtrusive or something. And um, I think it's something that is really great about um, offering video dance in a dance curriculum because it gets people to think about um, dance maybe in more of a language kind of way or um, in a way that it gets them to, well, it's, it, you think of it, video becomes um, an alternative environment, and I think that's really good. One of the things that, that another little irony is that over the last 10, 15 years, dancing in the streets has blossomed across the country. So, in, in fact, people have been making all sorts of studies of, of dancing in, in various environments, and I, I, I actually haven't seen many of those, but um, going back to what, what works in a, in, in a dance video. Um, oddly enough, I go back to what I've said, it, normally you don't see any dancing. 
If it's taken out, all of a sudden, as nature does, it seems that nature humbles them, overwhelms them, <laughs> muffles any movement. On the other hand, I've seen dance video works that are done outside in a landscape, and it doesn't work because it seems, I, I remember um, one that was done in a live from Off Center, it was a gorgeous landscape, very nice dancing, but the dancing seemed incongruous and the landscape seemed incongruous. So it goes back to what I say to good film, filmmaking. If you're going to have a scene on a dock, well, acknowledge the water or, or don't do it so, you know what I mean? It just seems like choose the sites. Maybe you're not there for 20 minutes. You probably could do one scene. Why did you need the desert? Well, you felt the desert in your soul. And why were you on the river? Well, every, in other words, I think back to the thing that film provides makes it longer, but this is what excites me, what I haven't seen yet, which is that when you do film, you have one scene. One person comes down the staircase, three seconds. You know who that person is, you've seen the staircase, but a dance video or something that was done on stage, you'd have 20 minutes, and that would be act one. Well, you know, choose all those landscapes, do something that works in a landscape, go someplace else. Brum, brum, brum. We're, we're going to go for another 10 minutes in here, and then we can continue the discussion uh, at lunch, but let's have some more. Nuria, we, do we have the mic? I oh, actually sorry. wanted to uh, just point out real quickly, which is, um, I think, why Maya Darren's work is continually re-examined, because we can't exhaust that relationship between her choices of setting and place and timing. And it has that layered kind of writing that screenwriting has. Um, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, and, and I teach screenwriting. And um, so I, I really wanted to just to comment on the, what's real important is the connection you're making, Deidre, and Martha's comment about, <coughs> um, excuse me, um, interacting on a continual basis and forming relationships throughout the country, both in terms of film festivals, as well as uh, teaching video dance in, in uh, departments. <coughs> Um, so, uh, what we have in, in filmmaking in, in film schools is called the University Film Video Association. And we put syllabi online for other schools to uh, take part of. And those kind of things might be really helpful. Um, and I, because I'm trying right now to bring more attention to video dance and film in Chicago and Columbia College. So. I would love to get your syllabus, actually, so thanks. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to speak to that because I recently distributed a survey to 25 dance programs asking, because I think that there's a, a little bit of a build now in, in offer, course offerings in video dance in universities. If any of you teach video dance, um, I can give you my email address right now. Just don't send me long personal detail, no. <laughs> but send me a syllabus, send me what you're doing, who teaches it, how's it being taught. Uh, I think if we all start networking, and I'm, I'm interested in helping with that, so my email address, oh my god, I'm giving this on the World Wide Web. <sighs> anyway, I'll be brave. It's MM, should I give it at lunch? Yeah. No, give it no. now. So okay, it's mmcurtis at Saturn dot vcu dot edu one more time <laughs> mm like the candy mm curtis c u r t i s at saturn dot vcu dot edu just like the planet yes Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment on the discussion between Doug and, and Lisa, and that, that's, um, I, I guess I, I don't see any way for the human mind to work other than to sort of keep trying what it, what it did before and make what's new um, out of re returning to the past. I mean, that's certainly... Uh, Film now we think is as a new 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 form of narrating, 
But they started by imitating theater. And in the process of that work, something new emerged. And I, I think if you look at most intellectual fields, that's how you have to work. I mean, the people who make the breakthroughs actually start in some old uh, form, and they try to come sol to solutions. And I, I guess um, I think that the, the, the way that the new is reached is, is by continuous work and standing back and reflecting, waiting in a way for the new to emerge being alert to that, um, you can't force it. I mean, I, I think that is an, another kind of modernist problem, you know, the imperative, make it new. That, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, you know, that's a prescription to paralyze yourself. So, yeah, try and redo the old techniques uh, with new material and, and then um, stay on the lookout to see uh, what, what new, um, directions start to emerge. Uh, I also, uh, at least personally, I'm not worried if people uh, are trying to transpose from one media uh, medium to, to, to another as a kind of way of getting the juices uh, moving because I, I, you know, I think that, that there's another modernist danger which is to uh, demand that media be pure. Uh, and uh, I think even in this conference, you hear the way we, we, we all talk. Some, some people are talking about new work, but they're saying cine dance. I mean, we don't really care that much about whether or not it's really pure. Uh, so anyway, just a comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, it was great to hear all you talk because I feel so. It was I was identified in each lab, in each uh, person that was talking here. Anyway, um, um, the, I have a question for Lisa because I've been thinking of something um, like the images that you projected or screened or whatever the name is that had the charcoal they had in a white background, and you said, now you can have the two dancers. Then you can compose by shooting them separated. You are creating a new dance by shooting them separated. Um, you had to shoot them, did you shoot them with a white background or with a real performance background? That's one question, I have another one. Well, I interestingly enough, um, that was shot in a blue screen room, okay, okay? and so, um, so the white background came through the digital processing. But in the other um, stills that I was showing you, those were shot with a white, in a white background. They were shot in my living room, um, where I have white walls and a white rug. Well, <laughs> this brings me... And I, I'm going to do a little bit of a free association, I think, about the personal. I mean, I'm a choreographer, dancer, and I'm a filmmaker. And I came from a low class, uh, you know, economically having a hard time in Spain and under a dictatorship. How this brings together, oh yes, then I am being in a situation sometimes of having good ideas but not having the money to, to do them. Uh, and that ties with Okay, let's see if we could tie everything together. I've been editing a lot lately. I make money that way, directing and editing. And I got all these uh, pictures, like if you want a fire, you can b buy this CD, get the fire from here. And if you want the music, you can buy my CDs. You know, I got this advertisement and I thought, one of these days I'm going to get solos. I'm going to get a solo from somebody and says, I sell you my solo for this amount. And if you want a duet, then I, you have the rights for this time to use these two duets. Then you can put them in a fire if you want with the music of who you want. And you have, I can direct, create this in my living room. Then what it ties with coming from a dictatorship and things like that is, is dance always going to be poor? And all the collaborators that uh, we love this media and we spend <laughs> money we don't have to learn all this technology, always going to be also poor. Uh, isn't it time to start thinking of who has the rights 
and how much money, because I can see that from the web, a choreographers are gonna start sending their, their dances and somebody else is gonna recreate them and say, this is my work and you have to pay for this. And the, and the choreographer will never get anything. And in, in, in the case of me now, uh, being a filmmaker, working with dance, it's a big problem economically. I cannot survive, really. Um, I'd like to add to that, because actually, if you don't mind, just real quickly, I think it's a miracle whenever anybody makes a film or video. Film and video is extraordinarily expensive. And I think the film video artists, are, we're doing everything we can to help one another. We lend cameras, we work for free when it's possible. We, um, we send money to one another that we don't even have, you know, uh, that a lot of people don't even have when you hear a friend can't get their print or whatever. It's for people that aren't attached to educational institutions, it's tremendously expensive. And, and the other side of it is that everyone that's involved in the production really deserves to be paid. The dancers deserve to be paid. The crew deserves to be paid. The filmmaker that's making it or the choreographer that's making it, they deserve not to, you know. I mean, basically, if you're making a project, you're throwing money out the window. You're not going to get it back. There isn't going to be a distributor. There isn't going to be any, anything coming in. Soon. Yeah, soon. I think that's where we're going. Oh, absolutely. I do think that's where we're going. But this is the reality at the moment. And that's why it was really great, actually, to hear some ideas about helping people out, anything that can be done. And I think also to add is, is, is maybe if, um, if there's something going out, if there's a situation that's going out, a lot of times people want names. They just do. It makes it easier to get money. It makes it easier to get corporate money. It, it just makes it easier. But if something could be piggybacked along with it, like if, if you have a program, okay, get your name in, but get, then get like three, four people that nobody's ever heard of. And also, let's be a little bit more tolerant of really, really bargain basement productions, you know, high eights, analog edited. Um, the technology is creeping up, it's expensive, and um, people still don't have access. Okay. Can I make a really brief comment in that? Is that if you are working in video choreography and you have any tendency to want to teach and you're good at it, do. Because <laughs> we need it. Where? Teaching. I'm but talking where? about. It doesn't pay to teach. Perhaps it will. I just want to say something about um, when we started this project. Um, I, I just started a new my job at university, but I didn't have all my equipment. Um, so when I started the collaboration with John, um, we started develop, putting on our own money. Uh, it was a side project. Um, it, the students didn't get credit for it even. It was totally outside. It was done on uh, weekends and you know holidays, and we put our own money into getting the equipment and our own time. Uh, so. Um, Hopefully it won't continue to be that way, but that's certainly how this project started and all the processing, I mean, lots of hours, many, many hours, and, and it was expensive. And it, so luckily we're still, you know, haven't uh, stretched the extent to which we can use the, the tools, so we're still using them now. That's a very good question. Give it to Lauren. Take one more. Just 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 take one Just take one more. Just Just take one more. 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 Just take one
I just wanted to bring it back to what Doug and, and, and Noel said about, uh, and also what we were talking about yesterday morning um, about being avant-garde and subversive and against the grain. And uh, there's a definition of original that I read years ago that John Berger wrote. And he said that being original was going back to the origin, which basically is going back in time. And, and I found that a really useful definition of, you know, well, how do you, you know, how can you be original these days? Well, you go back to the origin, whatever that means for you. And I also, again, on this whole idea of being avant-garde and subversive and against the grain, there's also a Dutch saying that I recently heard, which I believe in translation goes something like, being normal is strange enough. So those two things to think about.